we could definitely get weirder. So did those guys really name their app after a meme? Huh? Buckle up, fellow kids. It's time for Founder Quest. You know, last week I re recorded the, a quick little message talking about why we weren't recording our podcast. That was in the middle of the um, Let's Encrypt SSL certificate fiasco that swept across the internet. And, you know, at the time, it really didn't feel like, from our perspective, there wasn't much of an impact, but there was some impact. But then later on that day and the next day, I was reading some articles and like, apparently it was a pretty big deal for a lot of people. So yeah, it wasn't, wasn't yeah. just us. <laughs> it's one of those things like I could just kept seeing it more and more, like just pop up yeah. in random yeah. places though, too. Like not, not necessarily in our world, but it was just like affected all kinds of different things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So shout out to SSL Labs for their SSL testing tool. I'll have to put a link to that in the show notes. Whenever you have a question about your SSL, you should check that first because it does tell you when, when things are bad. Yeah, I hadn't used that tool before and it was very, very helpful on customer support, especially like sending to people and yeah. we needed to like prove that we were we were not at fault. So we could just like, <laughs> right. you know, it gave us like a smoking gun that we could. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Totally. Great. That's always a weird thing to do in customer service, isn't it? It's like, it's like, no, actually, like, I found the line in the library you mentioned that's actually the problem. It doesn't have anything to do with us. And then Facebook goes down. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking we are like spooky Tober is starting up. <laughs> yeah. Like, things are starting to get witchy. <laughs> I was like checked out the day Facebook went down. So I like missed most of like the the fun on whatever online on, I guess on what the other social networks that didn't go down <laughs> Twitter mostly. But yeah, that's kind of yeah. wild. The, the story that I, at least the, what I picked up, yeah, I'm not on favorite, Facebook. So <laughs> my favorite part is how they, um, how since everything was tied together, they couldn't get access to the building that had the servers to do the like manual physical reset thing right because our security like yeah like that's like i don't know that just seems like it's out of some sort of movie or something yeah like it's it's just like a comedy they like accidentally deleted their private keys to the building or something yeah or maybe like an oceans 11 um type movie where like they like the <sighs> the, the crew does that like the crew's like well if we mess with their dns records and they'll be locked out of the hotel for six hours which will give us time to like airlift the loot out. Yeah. What about like just like Mission Impossible, but with nerds, <laughs> you know, like trying to break yeah. into the building? I mean, that's what we are here at Founder Quest, right? aren't we? Yeah. Mission Impossible with nerds. <laughs> okay. So, in addition to all that just terrible stuff happening, there was some good stuff happened. We had our, we had the hook relay. Um, we did a little launch to our user base, our Honey Badger user base. Joe, want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, that was that, that was, was the day before the SSL problem. So, was yeah, that it? Was an, okay, that's, yeah. maybe that's why I, I was like the details. I was like trying to fit, like remember what I did last week or whatever, and <laughs> I was like, uh, and then I remembered. I'm like, how did I forget about the hook relay launch? But yeah, maybe that's. I spent the next day like on support. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, hook relay was impacted by the SSL thing, and so like the day after our launch day, we had to deal with the on fire kind of situation, but. You know, props to Kevin for quickly finding the issue and, and fixing it. And mm -hmm. uh, it's nice to have you know the serverless deployment that we have. So, so pushing it out was quick. That was that was nice. But yeah, we and we were we able to help some people on Twitter because we we did some crowdsourced troubleshooting and yeah, we were able to share our fix with a few few friends. So that was heroes. Cool. Hopefully we heroes. were. Yeah, that's, hopefully we saved the that's day. That's why you call people like you for everyone. <laughs> heroes. <laughs> so yeah, but I think the uh, launch went well. We had uh, an email out to our to the leveling up mailing list and got a pretty good response rate on that. We had uh, we put a banner up in on the on the website and we put a banner up on the app. Yeah, and those had some pretty good click throughs as well. I was just looking at the the, the stats from uh, Fathom this morning and mm -hmm. yeah, it was a good good share of traffic from those sources. So it's nice to see that people care enough to click through and see what we're working on. That was that's pretty cool. I felt pretty encouraged by just the you know the level of engagement that we got from everything. The worst that could happen is like you put out the, you know, you put out everything. It's just crickets. Like, yeah, I mean, people signed up. We got some signups and we started, I mean, like feature request throughput has increased for sure on like 
from almost zero to something. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we got, we got some feature requests coming in. That's, that's all good. Oh yeah. I suppose we should mention what hook really is and why people should be interested in it since yeah, that's yeah, some people might want to know. Are you going to tell the star what it is? Oh, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm dying to find out. <laughs> sure. Well, um, I'm on the edge of my seat over here. <laughs> there you go. I don't know. Hook Relay is an enterprise level blockchain analysis tool. No, it's not. Hook Relay lets you have webhooks that are as high quality as Stripe's webhooks, like very high quality, very fully featured in just like a couple of minutes without much code or work. And yeah, and Honey Badger, we have a lot of webhooks that go out and stuff. And we use that for our, all of ours, I think, right? We do. We use it for some of them at least. And so that's what it is. Yeah, great for debugging. And in the past week, I've, I've been doing a little side project that has inbound webhooks. And so uh, since I don't have it launched yet, it's been handling my inbound webhooks for me and just storing them so I can go back and replay the payloads against my my test instance. And there's a, there's a button in Hook Relay that I think, I think Kevin added, which I'm totally in love with now. It's the uh, copy as curl button. And so I can just oh, that's, click that button and drop awesome. in my terminal and boom, now I have a curl payload that I can send to my, my dev you know, server. It's great. The thing you're working on, like you can just like go do other things and it'll collect your inbound webhooks. Like just like your Jeffrey Bezos or something. <laughs> <laughs> like you could be on the beach doing whatever you want and then just, yeah, then just copy to curl. And no. you got it. Yeah. And then, and then even better, once I do launch, I would just add my production URL as the hook relay endpoint and then I'll actually start delivering them. So that's I don't have to change go. anything yeah. with that webhook provider that's sending me the stuff, right? The, well, does it have, cool. it has replay too, right? Like if you, if you have a bunch, can we, do we do that yet or? Uh, yeah, there is a resend button so you can, okay. you can send it again. So yep. like for local development, you could also like point it at like an ngrok, like, to your local host or something and yeah and replay some webhooks or something if you wanted to do it if you wanted to do it in real time right yeah that's cool yeah pretty handy maybe we should we make had... like a like a hook relay native ngrok that just like you know you can spin up your hook directly to your local host or something that would be kind of kind of cool i had the same thought this morning yeah like yeah. like stripe provides you a, a cli tool that will listen to their web hooks and then relay it to your local instance while you're yeah. developing i'm like oh yeah we should have the same thing for hook relay so they can yeah. just listen to your endpoint and suck it down and replay it for you yeah put it on the feature list yeah i do there is a danger here though that like if if you make it too easy for people like they might not feel like they're being productive or like they really bring much value. Like if, if you make it all so turnkey for developers and so easy, like the developer just might be like, what's, what am I even here for? Like, what's my job? You wouldn't feel like a hacker anymore. No, no. Yeah. Like that's something we got to watch out for as we, you know, move forward boldly. So yeah, we got a lot of the ideas for the hook relay launch to Honey Badger customers through a uh, tweet that I had sent out a few weeks before just asking like, like, what's the best way to launch uh, for you know for what a company with one product to launch another product and let their existing customers know? And asking Twitter is always, I mean, it's usually helpful. At least in our indie hacker space, everyone's always got ideas. So we got a lot of good ideas from people there, including I think one of one of the ideas was like, depending on how far we along we are, like you know, do you make a separate brand or like how do you like like how does it change the like the parent company? You know, if you're moving from you know, a one product company to, to multiple products. That's all interesting. We opted just to, you know, we're kind of like Honey Badger is the company and then it's Hook Relay by Honey Badger, I think is kind of our, our approach there. But there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Yeah, the one, the one snag on that has been the other day I was poking around in Stripe and I was looking at the email setting options they have. You can, you know, have Stripe send emails when a payment fails for example, and then it it's, you know, points them back to a payment collection page. And I was like, yeah, we, we should have that. So I click the button you know, to turn it on and I preview the email and the, it's based on the business name. So it says, oh, Honey Badger Industries, LLC, you know, payment page or whatever. And I was like, well, people who are Hook Relay customers aren't really going to recognize that name necessarily. So I can't have that. And so I went and dug around the, the Stripe settings and it's like, well, you can't really do anything but the actual business name on that particular page, even though on the 
in the Stripe settings, you can set the uh, the credit card like you know that shows up on the actual payment. You can change that, and uh, so that's in our case to hook your data, but you can't change the the email header from to be something different from the business name. And well, we haven't registered Hook Relay as a business name because it's like, eh, it's just a it's just a product, right? So mm-hmm. I didn't feel comfortable changing that in Stripe, you know, because like, well, it's really not our business name. Um, so I think like, well, maybe you do like a DBA or something. Yeah, I was going to yeah. suggest that. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's like, well, I guess perhaps it's time to register that DBA for Hook Relay so that I can actually change the business name and blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. You know, it's yeah. kind of exciting though. Like all the you co- all these pro- you know new problems come up, but it's because we have this new product that has to become more official. So we're like we were also talking about like uh, oh like now that we actually have some people using it, we're gonna need a way to like notify them of of changes to the product or improvements or you know all the all the little infrastructure things that we have for Honey Badger that we haven't quite gotten around to yet on Hook Relay. So mm-hmm. yeah. These are, these are nice, nice things to deal with as opposed to like crickets. <laughs> yeah. So glad that somebody showed up to actually use the app. Nice. So next up for Hook Relay is this quarter, we've decided to do some, spend some additional time on product development and implement some of those feature requests. I think that should be a, that should be a good time. Yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think we have a backlog of like 30 or so items in, in GitHub. So I think we have plenty of stuff that we could keep us busy for the next few months on Hook yeah. Relay. Cool. That's a yeah, and you were talking too. about taking a sort of multi-launch approach, right? We just always be launching. Meeting. Yeah, always be launching. So we're going to just have, from now on, every episode of this podcast, we're just going to launch. <laughs> launch Hook Relay. I'm going to make people explain what it is. And <laughs> Next week is show, show Hacker News. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess at some point, like you have to just call those things campaigns. <laughs> right. And it's instead of launches, but it feels very dynamic to call them launches. Yeah. Well, you got to call them a launch, like for the sake of the whatever platform your campaign is speaking to, because, you know, you got to make them uh, feel special. Yeah. Like the first, each, it's the launch for them. It's, you know, it's, it's for them. It's the, it's a, you know, it's the first launch ever. They've never heard of us before. I'm sure. Oh, that makes sense. It's like you're launching the campaign. Right. Yes, you're launching the campaign. So I think we'll probably be doing, I will do a show HN and we'll do a, we'll probably do something with indie hackers at some point, I imagine. There's a list. I, I saw a list uh, somewhere. I'll, I'll dig it if I, if I can find it, but um, just a list of like all those little, like all those, like a big list of platforms basically like that, that uh, you can, you know, forums basically. But you know, you know, we should go, we should go old school and we should do uh, regional launches. Like I used I used to work for a company where it was very much local, and so like every uh-huh. every few months it would be a new city. We're gonna you know send the crew. We're gonna set up stuff, and we're gonna launch in this city. So Thanks. we should totally do that. Like we should start. You know, of course, here in the Seattle area, and then branch out to California, and then you know move across the country. And, yeah. You're saying we're gonna do a national tour? Right. Does that mean Can we like get a bus? Lock the, you lock access based on like geolocation of their IP. <laughs> it's like yeah, sorry, we're not in your area yet. Please check back. Yeah. <laughs> Please, please sign out to be notified when we're in your area. <laughs> nice. Well, if we do regional launches, we might have to have regional managers. Oh, yeah. Hmm. You know, got to think about Didn't the org about chart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think like the the launch, you know, there's a lot of small places you can kind of launch to. I think the big one that is on our on our radar is Product Hunt. But I think we're quite, we're, you know, based on the advice we've heard about doing an effective like initial product hunt launch, it sounds like maybe it would be better to polish polish the product, have some feedback feedback about it, maybe like be a little bit more established or something. It just seems like the the products lately that have been really had really successful product hunt launches have been have had like they put a were like a lot of work into the actual like launch campaign for product hunt, like had a video and some of them almost seem like like Kickstarter, you know, quality type campaigns or something. I don't know how over the top we're going to go but i think the the current plan is to kind of do some of the smaller things and implement some feedback and start to we might we're we're planning on doing like a redesign of the website eventually with what we learn so then you have a designer in progress i think yeah 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 first i guess it's the first time we've had an external designer working on one of our products huh i think so did, did, did we, we have a that? we had no, someone we do had... we had someone do the honey badger website at one point star i we think did. you did yeah oh okay long yeah. yeah way way back i thought that was all star 
Yeah. Now I built it. I built the HTML, but I built it based off of like PDFs or something. Well, this time it's being built. So it's even more hands off. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so someone reached out to me on Twitter. And because we mentioned a few episodes ago that we were getting this design done, and I didn't know at the time what, what kind of built uh, was an option we had, whether it was going to be a uh, tailwind, which is what we're, our new hotness these days that we love, or it was going to be something else. And it's going to be something else. It's going to be bootstrap. But um, even it's bootstrap's heresy. okay. As long as, as long as we can modify it, that's, that's my thing. Like I remember back in way, way back in the day before Bootstrap, when we were doing, you know, freelancing for uh, people, we would get those designs from the designers and it would be a PSD. Right. And then we, I, yeah. I, I had no, no way to really deal with that. And so I would send it off to this chop, yeah, chop, shop, to chop shop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. XHTML shop, I think was the name of the business. I think they're still around even. They would take the PSD and convert it into HTML and CSS, which was, uh, you know, of questionable <laughs> quality, I guess. I mean, it worked, but it's like, ooh, it's ugly. Like, you're just like, yeah. mm, I don't ever want to touch that. And uh, yeah. and being able to actually have like a designer give you HTML and CSS, and it's actually going to be you know structured like in a sane way because it's based on a, a framework like Bootstrap. Like that's mm-hmm. that's awesome. That's it doesn't alternate like tabs and spaces. <laughs> Ah, those are the good old days. Yeah. All those designs. Those, just, those they just the wanted to keep you on your toes, Josh. <laughs> I remember, yeah, I used to do, I, well, I, I didn't do, do, I wasn't a chop shop, but I used to, you know, implement my own Photoshop designs and HTML and stuff. And that was fun. Like getting all the, the pixel <laughs> dimensions and the, you know, in your overall Photoshop layout and piecing it all together. Kind of like, it's kind of like a puzzle, like you're putting a puzzle together. Yeah. I mean, they called it a chop shop because, like, it was they made a lot of they made big use of the slice tool in Photoshop. That's right. Yeah. Where, yeah. Yeah. It, where you basically, you basically went in and, um, you know, you couldn't do CSS borders or drop shadows or anything like that. I mean, I guess you could do borders, but not like nice. They didn't have rounded corners. They didn't have drop shadows, anything like that. And so you basically go ha- had to go and like tell Photoshop, like, okay, like, you could uh, you tell it to split up the image in these parts and then like make this middle sort of a place for you to put some HTML. So you could put stuff in the middle of your box. And then I don't know, it was yeah. just, it was not the best. And so a lot of that bad HTML and CSS was, I mean, I imagine a lot of it was auto-generated. Yeah, there were even some, uh, some tools just to like, that would, you know, you kind of like draw your borders and stuff and, you know, fill out, I don't know, like, fill out some stuff in the app and then it just like generates the HTML page for you. And that was always like the worst, like the absolute worst uh, thing you could go with. But, you know, it, I guess this people's standards weren't as high in those days either. So you could get away with a lot, but yeah, we'll, we'll get to product hunt eventually. And yeah, I guess if, uh, if you as a listener have a tip for us on how to get a good product hunt launch going, uh, let us know. Um, or, and also we will hopefully involve, we're going to want to like bring in our networks to this, I think eventually. So yeah, I hope that all of our listeners will, will help us when the time comes to have a good product hunt launch with lots of upvotes and, you know, telling your friends and whatnot. And, and maybe we could even get one of our listeners who might be interested in have a particular talent for doing a product hunt promotion. Like we could even just hand that to someone and say, Hey, go, go do that for us. Yeah. That would be cool. that would be nice too, because then we wouldn't have to uh, do it ourselves. <laughs> yeah, Indeed. like a product hunt would, consultant. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. there's, there's got to be some out there. I mean, product hunt's been around long enough now. There's got to be specialists, right? Yeah. Well, isn't that kind of what Corey Haynes helped Derek with for uh, Sound mm-hmm. Cal, right? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. I'm sure Corey's really busy. So if someone wants to be like Corey and do that for us, that would be yep. totally awesome. We just need a we just need a guru. I was surprised the other day. I, I signed up for the product hunt RSS feed. I put that in my newsreader. And I was, I mean, I've I've seen, you know, product things on Twitter from time to time and I click through and I look at stuff, but I never really followed it closely. I was surprised how many launches there are on Product Hunt every day. There's a lot there. So I think you really gotta stand out in some way to be able to make some get some headspace because there's just yeah. a lot of competition for things on product hunt. I got to say like the, just the indie hacker space, like not indiehackers.com, but like just the overall indie hacker community is just like wild lately. Like, I don't know about you 
all, but I, I feel like a total just like dinosaur. Like, I feel like I'm like, grow, like, like I'm becoming out of touch. <laughs> so I need to like, I need to, I probably need to pay a little more attention to like, you know, what the, what the new, uh, or what the latest is. <laughs> I think it's inevitable that you get out of touch, right? <laughs> I don't want to be there yet. I'm not ready for it, Star. Oh, okay. <laughs> Geriatric honey badger developers. Right. There we are. <laughs> We're getting back out there. We did our uh, we did our AMA, our Indie Hackers AMA. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We'll have to do it. We'll have to do some AMAs for for Hook Relay too. The, like all that sort of stuff. I just like that. I love that. Like I just think if he if it seems like the the ecosystem is just much it's so much more developed than than when we launched honey badger there's so many more places to go especially if you have a tool that appeals to like the you know developer you know i guess just developers mm -hmm. and yeah and it feels like there's so many people in the community now who are you know identify in that group you know like there were what three micro conf conferences in the past three weeks or four weeks right there was two locals yeah. and then one in europe so yeah you know, that's just one indicator that there are a lot of people out there like us you know definitely more than there were 10 years ago who are enjoying this life of building things and selling them to people it's nice yeah I love awesome it. we should talk about the q1 2022 marketing campaign that we have in the works for uh, Hook Relay because I thought that was an interesting idea. The I guess I'll just say it. The the idea I think this was Ben your idea to basically we want we want to like try some marketing like you know putting some dollars behind Hook Relay and see if we can actually generate some you know new customers that way. We already have like a marketing budget and like a bunch of you know ongoing relationships and campaigns and stuff that we run for Honey Badger. So the idea was to basically just like have a swap. Not I think we're going to go with a quarter, not a month. Like just basically like try swapping out some of our advertisements for Honey Badger, which are typically like more like just kind of general awareness brand style, like you know keep us top of mind sort of advertisements. You know like. We do a lot of podcast ads and that sort of newsletter sponsorships. So swap them out for a little while and just replace them with Hook Relay and you know see how that goes. At the you know I guess the side benefit of that approach is that we we get to see what happens when we stop putting money into Honey Badger advertising, which is always I mean like that, that's a good experiment in its own. Like you know, so I'm interested to see how that how that turns out both on both sides. Like you know. Do we do we lose any momentum with Honey Badger? Do we gain a lot? Of, you know, how much momentum do we gain with Hook Relay? Yeah, it's, it's, it feels like kind of like the pricing experiments that you're always nervous about doing because you don't know if you're going to like royally hose your business, <laughs> 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 and you won't. And in our case, you don't know for a while. You have to let it play for a few months before yeah. you find out, right? And so, uh, it's, yeah, so switching the marketing like that feels like one of those experiments. It's like, well, oh, this could be really bad, or it could be like there's no impact. And so it's like, oh, well, then maybe it's we reevaluate how we spend our marketing dollars for Honey Badger at that point, you know? So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited, nervous, and excited about uh, trying that experiment. My prediction, I'll make a prediction. I don't imagine it's going to have a huge impact on Honey Badger conversions and signups and all that. At least not if we do, if we do like a quarter, I would, I'll kind of be surprised if we see any difference if we you know as long as we resume it just because like a lot of our advertising we just we really don't have like clear you know like like clear objectives <laughs> necessarily it's more just like brand advertising like yeah and we see we do see a lot of signups like of people coming to us because they heard us heard about us on a podcast or they saw us in a newsletter but it's not like click through it's not like a like pay per click or something or like a click through this and you're going to convert and we're going to track that so i think like the it would be bad if we stopped advertising entirely for like a year or two because people forget about you like i think that's why we do advertising for the most part at this point is just like so people remember that we're here and uh, so that's my prediction is that i don't think we'll see a huge impact on honey badger but i think that like because no one knows about Hook Relay, it could potentially have a big impact for for Hook Relay. Side note, you know, just all of our to all of our listeners, you all should really, you know, enable tracking on your browsers, <laughs> disable your ad blocks, 
And that'll make life a lot easier for us. It's be able to, you know, track funnels a lot easier. We so, can do. Thank you. <laughs> we can do marketing, do real marketing <laughs> on the internet. We're we're using Fathom on Hook Relay, and they're like the privacy, whatever privacy fo- first analytics tool that a lot of people use these days. And and they're also indie hackers, and I don't know, maybe Twitter friends for some of us, but they're pretty cool. And they have a feature that you can set up like a custom like domain that like hosts their tracking script. So that, like it because it's all like GDR and like privacy compliant like by default. But even so, like if they're added to like a ad blocker or you know like tracking prevention thing, you can host it on your own domain so that you know it's it's your guarantee to have accurate accurate results. Except for those people who are still using links as their browser, <laughs> right? If they're using or that yeah, if they're like if they're browsing from their terminal or if they have JavaScript disabled, yeah, there's you know, if, I mean, I guess if your if your uh, audience is like if you're Richard Stallman, if right? You're if your Stallman, audience is Linux is like Arch like, Linux we, we users, you, you're sorry. you're kind of out of luck, like no matter what, no matter what. Just just go put an ads on on slash dot and call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, slash dot. That's that's a tragedy, isn't it? <laughs> they really went downhill. You're still around though. Like one of the cockroaches of the internet, slash dot yeah, is still there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I haven't looked at it in years, but but back when I was posting my code to SourceForge, I was reading slash dot every day. Ah, oh, SourceForge. Oh, there you go. Source <laughs> SourceForge is still there, isn't it? Bizarrely hard to use. <laughs> yeah, it's probably still there. I don't even know. Yeah, and and two cows. <laughs> Subversion instead of Git. We're just yeah. this, this is the Wayback episode. We're going back to there you go. PSDs I mean, and SVN and slash dot. Every episode is kind of the Wayback episode <laughs> at Founder is. Quest. That's how we roll. We're Wayback founders. So I mean, our, our, our company name is now a vintage meme. So I guess we got to be way back. <laughs> yeah. We had a marketing meeting earlier and, and Ben Finley, our, our marketing manager, was like looking at our SEO performance. And he's like, like we, we could improve our website if we if we optimize the three megabyte GIF on the home page, I'm like, wait, wait, we have like a three meg, we have like a GIF on the home page, and I remembered we, I have like this Easter egg that if you click like the resolve button in the in like the screenshot of our of of Honey Badger on Honey Badger IO, it uh, well you can go and do it and you can see what happens. We'll we'll make sure we leave it in even if we optimize it, but yeah, that's how we roll. Is like we just like kill our search engine optimization because we had to have this Easter egg. That's awesome. But the the main thing reminded me that I have an interview being published tomorrow, I believe, in Saz Mag. I'll also link that in the show notes. But had a great chat. And it was funny because was like we were talking about humor. And that's like one of our core values of, of Honey Badger, uh, our business. And I was like, well, yeah, because like, I mean, we named our company after a meme, right? So like you gotta have fun in that kind of business, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> For sure. We should like send out a leveling up email that just is designed to rickroll our customers. <laughs> I don't know if they'd appreciate that. <laughs> we should rename Hook Relay the Berries and Cream. <laughs> That's creative. Uh, I mean, Hook Relay is kind of like very like business, business formal, descriptive. So we could, we could definitely go get weirder. For sure. Yeah, that was, that was not one of my more creative days when I picked that name. I mean, the the other, you know, the upside is that it actually tells people what it does. <laughs> it's instead of it is not just named after a after an animal joke on the internet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Also, it has a uh, proper casing. Yeah, that's you know one of the things that's funny. I, like, I have this eye now for whenever we write anything, like we're doing any kind of copy or blog post or whatever, and if we ever reference GitHub. Without the capital H in it, I always catch it now because yeah, because of how many people miscapitalize Honey Badger. <laughs> like mm-hmm. so, I, I knowing how much that like I, I catch that, I was like, oh, I bet the GitHub people really appreciate it when people actually capitalize their name properly. And so yeah, mm-hmm. it's like yeah. sticks out to me all the time now. The pr- just for the listeners, the proper capitalization is one capital at the front and, because it's one word. It's not two words. Bingo. Two capital letters. Two capitals, yeah. Because it's those two get lab. But I also now notice the companies that are like us, where they have deci- they have opted for the the lowercase in the second word as well. There's a mm-hmm. few of those out there. 
I'm not uh, remembering them off the top of my head, but I, I, they always stick out. I mean, I usually remember those now too, if I'm familiar with them or I, or I know that I need to go check and I always go and like check when I'm writing their name, at least usually. Like if you just want to like just set, set the world on fire, you can be Stripe and have your logo, your name of the logo, low, all lowercase, but then in your body text, capitalize it. Right. <laughs> like th- they just want to watch the world burn. <laughs> This episode of Founder Quest has been brought to you by Hook Relay, Stripe quality web hooks in minutes. It's awesome. Thank you. If you want to like, give us a review on Apple Podcasts, whatever they call it now, I don't know. iTunes, they used to call it iTunes. Please do that. If you want to, if you're interested in writing for um, our blog, we are, you know, currently looking for Ruby, Python, PHP writers. Go to our, our blog at honeybadger.io forward slash blog and look for the right press page. And yeah. All right. So I will talk to you guys next week. Founder Quest is a weekly podcast by the founders of Honey Badger. Zero instrumentation, 360 degree coverage of errors, outages, and service degradations for your web apps. If you have a web app, you need it. Available at honeybadger.io. Want more from the founders? Go to founderquestpodcast.com. That's one word, where you can access our huge back catalog of episodes. FounderQuest is available on iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of fine podcasts. We'll see you next week.